Namaste, my dear brothers and sisters. The love and blessings of the mother and Sri Aurobindo to all of you from Sri Aurobindo Ashram Delhi branch. Today I'll uh, share with you my limited understanding of a few pages from uh, The Life Divine by Sri Aurobindo. And uh, if I were to sum up uh, the essence of uh, these paragraphs that uh, we shall discuss today, it could be stated thus, realism is not the same as reality. You know, when we say that uh, we should be realistic, what we are trying to say is that uh, we should not uh, be dreamers, we should not uh, imagine things which are impossible. In other words, the realism draws the boundary between what is possible and what is not possible. For example, suppose I have cancer and I start believing that I'll get cured, uh, Somewhere indirectly people start telling me, be realistic, hmm? cancer is incurable. And if one were to talk about uh, the cancer on a much vaster scale, that is uh, sorrow and suffering in the world, if one talks about the vision of Sri Aurobindo and the mother, that one day the world will be free from all sorrow and suffering, one would say, well, uh, that is just imagination, be realistic, that's not really possible. Hmm? So. We feel that when we talk about realism, we are just trying to be rational, reasonable, and drawing a clear boundary between what is possible and what is not possible. Now, if uh, one were to think of uh, the past, which can give us a clue to what is possible in the future, towards the end of the 19th century, there was a bishop who was uh, once told that soon probably we'll have a machine uh, riding in which people will be able to fly. What was his answer? His answer was, if God intended man to fly, he would have given him wings. And then lo and behold, 10 years later, around 1902, his sons, hmm, Oliver and Wilbur Wright, invented the aeroplane. So when he said that if uh, God intended man to fly, he would have given him wings, you'd say, well, he's being realistic. But then that was not the boundary of what is possible. Just 10 years later, he was proven wrong. But then it's not because uh, that Bishop was uh, unusually uh, sort of restrictive in his thinking. If somebody were to tell us uh, 50 years ago that a day will soon come when uh, you will be able to type something in your computer or phone and uh, just click something and uh, that message will be delivered in real time the message could be in words and the message could even be a picture. It will be delivered in real time across the globe almost instantane instantaneously. Oh no, be realistic, how can that happen? But then it has happened, it is happening. And even if 10 years ago somebody told us that uh, you can put an idea with a few sort of uh, defining things which uh, you would want to be incorporated and tell uh, a man-made device, write an essay on it or compose a poem on it, within a few seconds the essay or the poem will be there and uh, it will have a quality which will give any good writer or poet a run for his money. And yet chat GPT can do it today. Hmm? Now which means that uh, when we say that be realistic, we are not really talking about what is possible or impossible, we are just talking about something which we currently feel in terms of our uh, limited experience and understanding that this is possible and this is not possible. So that is basically the theme of what uh, we shall be discussing today. And uh, this occurs in, uh, the, in book one of the Life Divine in chapter seven, which is titled The Ego and the Dualities. And uh, I'll start on uh, page 55 in my edition of the book, which is the SABACL edition. Uh, it is not very easy for the customary mind of man, always attached to its past and present associations, to conceive of an existence still human, yet radically changed in what are now our fixed circumstances. So Shirvindu says it's not impossible, but certainly not very easy for the customary mind, the ordinary mind of man, which is what? Which is always attached to its past and present associations. So we are always thinking in terms of uh, what we have seen in the past and uh, what our 
present is like and it is in light of that that uh, we also visualize the future. So with this, these limitations, with this limited sort of uh, uh, data based on the past and the present, it is not easy for the mind of man to conceive of an existence still human, yet radically changed in what are now our fixed circumstances. So you conceive of an existence still human, which means we'll say, well, it may be possible for the gods, hmm? uh, but uh, what uh, Indra or Varun or Agni can do, we can't. Huh? So for gods it may be possible, but an existence which is still human. For that existence, we feel that uh, it is not possible because we can't conceive it. And what is it that we can't conceive? Which is existence which is still human, not godly, yet radically changed in what are now our fixed circumstances, that the conditions remaining the same, the circumstances remaining what we have in the world, in those circumstances, it is almost impossible for the customary human mind to conceive of an existence still human, yet radically changed in what are now our fixed circumstances. And then he goes on to give an example of the apes, the monkeys, and he says that uh, it would have been impossible for them to visualize that uh, there will be a creature one day who would use a new faculty called reason upon the materials of his inner and outer existence, who would dominate by that power his instincts and habits, change the circumstances of his physical life, build for himself houses of stone, manipulate nature's forces, sail the seas, ride the air, develop codes of conduct, evolve conscious methods of his mental and spiritual development. So, you know, these are things which human beings do. But it would have been impossible for a monkey to imagine that such a creature would ever arrive on this planet, whether such a creature is even possible. And uh, on top of that, it would have been even more difficult that such a creature will develop from the ape itself. That is, it is uh, not something which will... Uh, just appear out of the blue, but a little more uh, expression of what is hidden in the ape is what will give rise to a man. And it's just a little more unfolding. In fact, it has been found that more than 99% of the genetic makeup of a monkey is the same as that of man. So it's just that less than 1% that makes all the difference. So, and if such a conception had been possible for the ape mind, it would have still been difficult for him to imagine that by any progress of nature or long effort of will and tendency, he himself could develop into that animal. So, on one hand, such a creature would, uh, is something that is possible, would have been impossible for the monkey to imagine or an ape to imagine, and on top of that, even more uh, difficult will it be for the ape to imagine that such a a creature would uh, develop from itself, that the ape itself would develop into that sort of an animal, which we now call man. Now man, because he has acquired reason and still more, because he has indulged his power of imagination and intuition, is able to conceive an existence higher than his own and even to envisage his personal elevation beyond his present state into that existence. However, man is different from an ape. In the sense that uh, at least once in a while, man does indulge in uh, imagination and has some intuitive abilities. That is the abilities which come from a level higher than the mind. And uh, by indulging in those, at least man is able to conceive an existence higher than his own, which the ape could not. Not only is he able to conceive of an existence higher than his own, it's not easy, but it's a man can conceive of uh, an existence higher than his own, but he can even envisage, that is, visualize, see in his imagination his personal elevation beyond the present state into that existence. So you can see that I myself can, that is, the human being itself can elevate itself to a level which is much higher than the present level. So at least uh, he can conceive of it and considers it a possibility. But all the same, a possibility which is a somewhat uh, something of a remote and theoretical possibility. That is what we call realism. 
His idea of the supreme state is an absolute of all that is positive to his own concepts and desirable to his own instinctive aspiration. So actually when he develops the idea of uh, something much beyond himself, man is uh, thinking of firstly all that is positive and absolute that thinking man is capable of and then he also thinks that it will be desirable to be that perfect and also man f feels that somewhere that I want to be that. So there's an instinctive aspiration which man has for crossing the boundaries for transcending his present state. And what is, what will that state consist of? Knowledge without its negative shadow of error. So he thinks that it should be possible to have knowledge, knowledge with a capital K, that is knowledge which includes everything, having known which nothing else remains to be known. He is able to think of that knowledge and uh, since it will be complete and total knowledge, integral knowledge from which nothing is left out, there will be no room for any mistake, there will be no room for any error. So knowledge without its negative shadow of error. Normally our partial and limited knowledge including and particularly scientific knowledge has that shadow of error all the time. That's why you know, no scientist ever says that what I have, I'm telling you is 100% uh, true. All that says is that P is less than 0 0.01. What it means is even 0 0.01 is considered a very high sort of a level of accuracy. P is less than 0 0.01 means the probability is that uh, what I'm telling you is correct is uh, more than 99% or there's a less than 1% chance of an error which may be due to chance or some accidental mistakes that have occurred or limitations of my methods of uh, study that w less than 1% possibility of error still remains and that type of a scientific fact is considered a scientific fact which has been established at a very high level. Mm. So that is what uh, s no, scientific knowledge is about. So, but m man has an aspiration for knowledge without its negative shadow of error. No negative shadow of error, not even that less than 1% error. That's what human being aspires to. What else is the aspiration? Bliss without its negation in experience of suffering. So in the same way bliss, that is uh, a state of uh, perfect uh, sort of joy and that's why we are using a different expression bliss. Bliss goes much beyond even joy or ananda. It's, uh, we might call it uh, bliss may be translated as ananda. Now. Just as knowledge should not have any shadow of error, this bliss should not have any shadow of suffering. I mean, completely devoid of suffering, completely uh, free from suffering. Bliss without its negation in experience of suffering. What else? Power without its constant denial by incapacity. So man wants power, at least thinks that uh, the most desirable thing would be to have that type of power which does not get contaminated or which does not get limited by any form of incapacity that is the inability to do something which means one should be able to do everything everything should be possible power without its constant denial by incapacity and purity and plenitude of being without the opposing sense of defect and limitation. So another thing which man aspires to is that level of purity and plenitude that is uh, everything being available without the opposing sense of defect and limitation. So purity which is not contaminated in any way by anything negative and plenitude which does this is not limited by the absence of anything. So that is the type of conception we have. Ape may not be able to even imagine it, man can, and ape certainly may probably does not have the aspiration to approach it, leave aside, attain it, but man has both the aspiration and at least somewhere deep within this sort of a feeling that maybe I'll be able to attain it. So that is what distinguishes man from all other animals. 
So his idea of the supreme state is an absolute of all that is positive to his own concepts and desirable to his own instinctive aspiration, knowledge without its negative shadow of error, bliss without its negation in experience of suffering, power without its constant denial by incapacity, purity and plenitude of being without the opposite, so without the opposing sense of defect and limitation. It is so that he conceives his gods. Well, he thinks that at least the gods probably have this sort of uh, knowledge and power and purity. It is so that he constructs his heavens and uh, he also visualizes some other world, a world other than he, this one, which he calls heaven, where these things are possible. But it is not so that his reason conceives of a possible earth and a possible humanity. But he thinks that that is not something that can happen on this earth to humanity. It is something for the gods and it happens elsewhere in heaven, not on this earth. His dream of God, now God with a capital G, and heaven is really a dream of his own perfection. But he finds the same difficulty in accepting its practical realization here for his ultimate aim as would the ancestral ape if called upon to believe in himself as the future man. So he does dream of it, he can conceive it, he has an aspiration for it, but he finds it unrealistic. And uh, he has the same difficulty in accepting its practical realization, that is for it to actually become real. Uh, he has the same difficulty which the monkey would have. So uh, uh, he looks at it with something impossible the way the, a monkey might visualize the possibility of a human being. But he finds the same difficulty in accepting its practical realization here for his ultimate aim as would the ancestral ape if called upon to believe in himself as the future man. His imagination, his religious aspirations may hold that end before him. But when his reason asserts itself, rejecting imagination and transcendent intuition, he puts it by as a brilliant superstition contrary to the hard facts of the material universe. So that is where realism steps in. So his imagination allows it, his religious aspirations, his spiritual aspirations, they allow it, not only they allow it, his religious and sp spiritual aspirations may hold that end before him, may hold that end, that is, that as the ultimate goal for him, which means that it is possible, if not in one life, in several lives. So the religious and spiritual aspirations may hold that end before him, but when his reason asserts itself, because reason is that instrument which man trusts the most. He does not trust his intuition, he doesn't trust his imagination. That he thinks is good for uh, dreaming, but he doesn't trust intuition and imagination as something which uh, is within the realm of what is possible. So when his reason asserts itself, rejecting imagination and transcendent intuition, he puts it by, sets it aside. He puts it by as a brilliant superstition contrary to the hard facts of the material universe. So it doesn't really, it's not, doesn't seem to be consistent with the facts that prevail in the material universe, particularly on this planet. So that is something which he feels is impossible. So he sets it aside as something which is okay as an imagination, it's okay as a religious ideal, uh, but uh, he does not think that uh, it is something realistic. It becomes then only his inspiring vision of the impossible. So he thinks that, well, it's an inspiring vision, but basically all this that I have conceived and imagined and intuitively perceived, all that is basically impossible. And then comes a grand sentence as the final sentence of this paragraph. All that is possible is a conditioned, limited, and precarious knowledge, happiness, power, and good. 
sums up the whole paragraph. Eh? All that is possible, that is in contrast to what is impossible. So all that is possible is what we call all that is realistic. Hmm? All that is possible is a conditioned, limited, and precarious. Three adjectives for all these things. Eh? Conditioned, that is, we have been conditioned by our environment, conditioned by our parents, conditioned by our teachers in school, conditioned by our own intellect. All this conditioned by our past and present experience. Now all this leads to a limitation by through conditioning. Is a conditioned limited. That is, it has boundaries, clear boundaries between what is possible and impossible. It's conditioned, limited, and precarious. Precarious because it lacks certainty. Knowledge which we consider to be true, say scientific knowledge, may tomorrow turn out to be wrong. Hmm? Say a case in point, uh, there was a time when doctors said that when, you, when a person has peptic ulcer, he should take a low fiber diet because fiber would irritate the ulcer or the inflamed the stomach, you know, inside. So a person has a peptic ulcer, low fiber diet, very rational. Today, 50 years later, what do we say? Take a high fiber diet because it will absorb water, it will have a soothing effect, it will form a viscous gel in the stomach and it will soothe your stomach. Huh? The acid will be able to act less on your thing if you have that viscous water holding mass in the tummy rather than let the acid act directly on the mucosa. Low fiber diet to high fiber diet within 50 years. So the knowledge 50 years ago is precarious. And what we think is correct today in terms of scientific knowledge, another 50 years later, just the opposite may shown to be what is right. So it's precarious. And this applies not only to knowledge, but also to other things. Because Sherbindo talked about all these things, no? Knowledge, which has no error. Hmm? Happiness, which has no shadow of suffering. Now again, a person is very happy. Hmm? Everything is right with my life. On top of the world, on cloud nine, as they say, huh? the person is. And then, the next day, everything has changed. Hmm? So anything can happen. So it's precarious. Huh? And that's why, you know, in Ramayana, we haven't put that... Uh, beautiful illustration of how things can change. One day, Rama will be the king tomorrow. Huh? But actually what happens, he's told go to the forest for 14 years. So th this type of a dramatic change can happen to any of us. Then, power. Very powerful, but then not that absolute power which has no trace of incapacity. Now, again the same thing, the person thinks that uh, I'm all powerful, huh? I'm the supreme person in this organization or whatever, huh? drunk with power, intoxicated with power. And uh, then what happens? An incurable illness, all that power is useless. Huh? Incapacity to use that power of position, wealth, all that becomes completely useless. Hmm? Or nothing else, age catches up with the person, the person superannuates, as they say, retires, all that power is gone. Eh? Or say if he is a part of a democratically elected government, all power. Next election, you lose the power, the power is gone, you lose the elections. So it's precarious, eh? everything is precarious. So it's uh, conditioned, whether it's uh, knowledge or whether it's happiness, happiness is also conditioned. These are the things make me happy, these are the things which make me unhappy. Now, that is also a type of conditioning. Uh, if it is a sweet gulab jamun, it makes me happy. If it's a sweet rasgulla, it makes me happy. But if it's a sweet apple, not so happy. Uh, but both are sweeter. So, again, conditioning. Huh? And precarious. Always risky. Here, now and then gone. And uh, same applies to good, that is purity, which Aurobindo had earlier called purity. 
that purity or that goodness that we imagine is also conditioned. Good and evil, we know that uh, a lot depends upon our conditioning. Uh, what is good here may not be good a few thousand kilometers away from here. What is good today may not be considered good uh, 500 years later. You can find so many. So these things keep changing, and that's why I talk in terms of yoga dharma and so on, what is right and wrong in this period. That may not be, so desh, kal, is, uh, that is place, time. All these things change our concepts of good and evil. So it's, that's conditioning and cultural sort of uh, development, all that contributes to it. Uh, limited and precarious. Precarious again, the person thinks that, well, I have achieved now a great deal of purity, and uh, then comes a temptation, and all that purity is gone. Huh? That was the type of test that was put even to the gods and uh, the great mystics huh? when uh, they were about to uh, sort of uh, reach that final state of perfection. Then out of mischief, the gods sent a beautiful apsara huh? <laughs> to tempt him. <laughs> so uh, all that purity is gone. So th it is, again, that purity was conditioned, limited, and on top of that, precarious. Could be gone in a moment. Huh? So this is uh, the type of view of realism that we have. Although in spite of having the ability to imagine and intuitively feel as possible something which is way beyond what we consider to be realistic, which uh, has knowledge which is uh, complete and absolute. Uh, Ananda, which has no trace of suffering, uh, which has power, which has no trace of incapacity, and purity, which, is, which has no trace of any impurity or contamination by any evil. Now, Shirobindo gives a little different turn to this in the next paragraph, and that's also important, because this may make us feel that now we have discovered what is realistic and what is uh, real, but still, the impression at the end of this paragraph is that uh, uh, imagination and intuition are fine, but probably on the whole it is safer to be realistic. But uh, then a little different uh, line, is all, uh, way of thinking is also important, and that's why we can go to the next paragraph. Yet, hmm, Shirobindo always does that. He initially gives you a point of view which is not exactly his own and uh, makes it look so real, reasonable, that you feel that, well, ba asal mein baat to yehi hai. Hmm? But then, after all that, making a very powerful case for a point of view which is not really his own, then come the next paragraph, will come the but or the yet. Huh? So that's how the next paragraph begins with the yet. Yet in the principle of reason itself, there is the assertion of a transcendence. For reason is, in its whole aim and essence, the pursuit of knowledge, the pursuit, that is to say, of truth by the elimination of error. So, after all, what is reason aiming at when it is aiming at knowledge? Hmm? All scientific knowledge is pursued with the help of reason, but what is the type of scientific truth that scientists are trying to aim at? Their aim is to find that truth which will have no error, which will have no shadow of error, which means that, and who gives them this uh, desire and also th and the possibility that such a truth may one day be discovered? The same faculty of reasoning. So reasoning can be elevated to a level where it feels that it is quite realistic to arrive at knowledge which has no error, which means the possibility of transcendence, that is, transcendence is going beyond. The possibility of going beyond our present limitations is built into reason itself. So our view of what is re reasonable or what is within the scope of reasoning is itself conditioned, is itself limited, and it's a self-imposed limitation. The limitation is self-imposed. It is not a limitation of the faculty of reasoning itself. There's a shade of a difference between the two. Hmm? The faculty of reasoning doesn't have the limitation. The limitation has been imposed by us because of conditioning and all those things. Huh? So 
Yet in the principle of reason, that if we took at reason just as a principle, not the way it functions in us, yet in the principle of reason itself, there is the assertion of a transcendence. So asserting transcendence is also a part of reason. Why? Because reason in its whole aim, what is the aim of reason? Is, to, is, the, is the pursuit of knowledge, the pursuit that is to say of truth by the elimination of error. So that's how scientific knowledge grows. You keep arriving at a reasonable truth, but then it, you know that there is some element of error in it possible. So you keep eliminating those errors one by one. And that is how you reach, at, reach truth which has less error. Which means that if this process is continued to its logical conclusions, if this process continues ad infinitum, that is eliminating errors bit by bit, ultimately, at least there is a possibility we will arrive at knowledge which will have no error. So to arrive at knowledge which will have no error is also possible with the help of, at least the possibility of is within the realm of reasoning. So reasoning does not make it appear impossible. So that was what you were talking about. So reasoning does not make pursuing the type of knowledge which will have no error impossible. So that limitation is, doesn't reside in reasoning itself. It resides in the way we use our reason. It's a self-imposed limitation on the faculty of reasoning. For reason in its whole aim and essence, for reason is in its whole aim and essence the pursuit of knowledge, the pursuit that is to say of truth by the elimination of error. Its view, its aim is not that of a passage from a greater to a lesser error, but it supposes a positive pre-existent truth, truth with a capital T, towards which through the dualities of right knowledge and wrong knowledge, we can progressively move. So it considers moving to that absolute truth with a capital T, that is, which is total knowledge, through a progressive process, a process which may involve along the way some errors but ultimately, we'll get to a point where there will be no error left. If our reason has not the same instinctive certitude with regard to the other aspirations of humanity, it is because it lacks the same essential illumination inherent in its own positive activity. So it's the lack of illumination, illumination coming from a deeper source, that is uh, the soul or its dynamic aspect, the psychic being, it's th the absence of that illumination which imposes this limitation, which creates this self-imposed limitation, which means that we have to break essentially, that again comes to the same essential thing. We have to break that barrier. We have to dissolve that uh, screen. We have to uh, get rid of that wall that divides that illumination from the way our surface acts, including the surface mind, including the surface way the reasoning works. Reasoning is also a part of the mental part of the being, and uh, that's what our surface is like, but the surface can be illumined. If it gets illumined by that deeper level, then it will not feel that it is impossible. Then it will consider it within the realm of possibility to arrive at knowledge which uh, has no error. We can just conceive of a positive or absolute realization of happiness in the same way Realizing absolute happiness, which has no trace of sorrow, is also possible through the faculty of reasoning. Because the heart to which that instinct for happiness belongs has its own form of certitude. Happiness belongs to that part of the mind, which is uh, essentially the vital. But then the vital has its own form of certitude. When it's illumined by that deeper source, it acquires that certainty that yes, happiness without suffering is possible. And it is that same heart that is, which is also capable of faith. And because our minds can emphasize the elimination of unsatisfied want, which is the apparent cause of suffering. So we can visualize, uh, just as we can visualize the elimination of error in knowledge, we can also visualize the elimination of unsatisfied want. Because that is the source of suffering. The source of suffering is an unsatisfied want. We want something, but what exists is actually different. There's a gap between what we want and what actually exists. So there's an unsatisfied want. That unsatisfied want corresponds to an error in knowledge. So just as we can visualize that bit by bit errors can be eliminated, in the same way, we can also visualize that bit by bit unsatisfied 
wants or desires can also be eliminated. And that is what will give rise to that sort of a bliss in which there is nothing else desired, there's no desire left. We can reach that and when we reach that state, there will be no suffering because there will be nothing that we would want which actually does not exist. So this type of, uh, and the fact that this can happen till it has actually happened is a part of faith. Faith is something which we believe in but which is only a future possibility and uh, that faith also resides in the same heart. Which means that uh, the way we have been constituted, we have that capacity, at least whether the apes are able to do it or not, uh, we can't say, probably they can't, but human beings have been given that capacity to be able to visualize knowledge which has no error and to visualize happiness which has no suffering. And they can see logically how that can happen that absolute knowledge can come by progressive elimination of error and that absolute bliss can come by progressive elimination of unsatisfied desires. <coughs> but how shall we conceive of the elimination of pain from the nervous sensation or of death from the life of the body? Now these are the other things which can be a source of suffering at the sensory level, at the, in the fear of death, Yet, the rejection of pain is a sovereign instinct of the sensation. So, that also is built into us. We have pain, yet we know that the pain can go. That's also built into our sensory apparatus. And similarly, rejection of death, a dominant claim inherent in the essence of our vitality. The fact that we can reject death is also built into us. And how can we reject it? By going to that deeper knowledge, which again comes from the deepest self, our soul, that my essence is immortal. The form may be mortal, but the essence is immortal. So that is what takes away the fear of death and in a way rejects death. But these things present themselves to our reason as instinctive aspirations, not as realizable potentialities. So once again, he repeats that w all this is true, that reason and mind itself have these possibilities, but we do not visualize them as uh, realizable potentialities. Yet the same logic, and then again, to further sort of give a push to the uh, possibility that these unrealistic things can happen, the next paragraph again starts with a yet. Yet the same law should hold throughout the error of the practical reason is an excessive subjection to the apparent fact which it can immediately feel as real and an insufficient courage in carrying profounder facts of potentiality to the logical conclusion. So we do not take the possibilities of reason, something which even reason supports, as we saw in this previous paragraph, we do not carry it to its logical conclusion. And that is why we again remain limited and that is what we call practical reason. That means practical reason is again sort of a self-imposed limitation. This is practical and we'll stop at that assumed level of practicality instead of taking the reason, reason, the process of reasoning to its logical conclusion. The error of the practical reason is an excessive subjection to the apparent fact which it can immediately feel as real and an insufficient courage in carrying profounder facts of potentiality to their logical conclusion. What is, is the realization of an anterior potentiality. Present potentiality is a clue to the future realization. Anterior means ahead, what is in front of us. So, it's realization of not something unrealistic, but of a potential. A potential is considered realistic, that the potential is far more, far greater than the present reality. So it's just a realization of an anterior potentiality and to which present potentiality is a clue. And uh, what is a clue today could be a realization in the future. Just as uh, 10 years before the aeroplane was invented, the potentiality was visible that man will be able to fly. So a potentiality of the present 
is a clue to the future realization. And here potentiality exists for the mastery of phenomena depends upon a knowledge of their causes and processes. And if we know the causes of error, sorrow, pain, death, we may labor with some hope towards their elimination. Which means that we have to go to the base, to the root. The root cause of error, which we want to eliminate to arrive at absolute knowledge. The root cause of sorrow, which should be eliminated to arrive at bliss. The root cause of pain, to arrive at freedom from pain and suffering. The root cause of death, which uh, will help us reject and in that sense conquer death. And uh, the hope lies in finding the cause. And the cause is essentially what? Essentially not letting our surface illumined by the deepest source and therefore always staying in a state of avidya rather than in a state of vidya. The degree of avidya may differ, but uh, it's that avidya, that lack of total knowledge, lack of that realization of the deepest truths of existence, which is responsible for all these things. So once we realize that that is the cause, then we have to work on eliminating that cause, which is what the path of yoga is all about. Because once we have that knowledge, then it's gone. And that comes in the last sentence of this paragraph, for knowledge is power and mastery. So ultimately, boils down to that knowledge, and for that knowledge is all the sadhana. So with this I can more or less conclude, but uh, let me share with you to what extent intuition uh, can make things possible, and uh, it's just that we have learned and we got conditioned not to trust our intuitive abilities. If we trust this ability, we can develop it further and learn more from it. We normally look upon the dynamic aspect of the soul or the psychic being as a guide. That is, it tells us what is right and wrong. We can visualize in advance by going to that deepest level of the psychic being that this is right, this is wrong. If I do the right thing, we can also anticipate I'll get joy and lasting mental peace. And we can visualize if I ignore this voice, I'll get recurrent uneasiness and a sense of guilt. But then that is not all the function of the psychic being. The mother has said that another function of the psychic being is to give us access to knowledge which resides at a level higher than the mind. So that's what we have seen, that we can use that same psychic being to illumine our mind and the intellect, and that will give us access to a level of knowledge which is beyond the mind. And in fact, scientists do not like to acknowledge it, but all great leaps in science have also come through that same process. For example, a scientist visualizing that uh, it should be possible to send a message across the globe by doing this or that is an intuition because it looks unrealistic. But unless somebody had that unrealistic dream, it would not have become a reality. So that potentiality, future potentiality, comes to us as present in the form of an intuition. And uh, that comes from the psychic level. So the psychic being is also a source of knowledge which is not accessible to the ordinary mind. And the third thing which follows from the second, which the mother says, third function of the psychic being is to exceed ourselves, which means to go beyond where we are, to be able to do much more than we think is reasonable or realistic. So these are the three functions of the psychic being. So it again goes down to the discovery of the psychic being and realizing it to such an extent that our life can be organized around it. If we organize our life around it, not only we'll be able to dis distinguish clearly between right and wrong and act on what we perceive to be right, but we'll also have knowledge which is far beyond what we, the mind is capable of, and uh, we will therefore be able to transcend our limitations, we'll be able to exceed ourselves. And I'll give you an example of something which I have seen myself in a demo recently. Uh, you, and who's, uh, let me ask you one thing, uh, whose uh, intuitive abilities are better developed because the person trusts them better? A child or an adult? Hmm? A child, yes, a child, you see, because the child has still had much less period in this life to get conditioned. So the child, the child is a dreamer. Huh? If you tell a child a story, 
that the uh, that there was a dog and a cat talking to each other the dog said this and the cat said this the child doesn't say dogs and cats don't talk and will the cat understand the language of the dog the child don't doesn't ask that type of questions eh? the child is able to believe many things which look unrealistic to us and in the same way the child also sometimes thinks that maybe one day i'll be able to fly like a bird so these are things which a child can easily do because the child is not conditioned now children can be trained to develop this intuition further and i've seen this demo uh, children who have been trained in this way you blindfold them yeah. blindfold them completely and then you take say a book like this and you open it on any page you like and give that book to that child to hold uh, and ask the child on which page is the book open the child will you tell you the ch book is open on page 468 and 469 looks like a miracle but it's possible so that is the level to which we can exceed ourselves if this intuitive ability is well developed which means that being able to see without using the eyes so with that thing which looks like magic unless you actually have seen it happen uh, we can end this session unless there are some quick questions We often hear, so you think, so you are. Sorry? So you think, so you are. It's a quote by Buddha, mm -hmm. Gautam Buddha. So you think, so you are. Whatever you think, you can be. Or uh, can you reflect on that mm -hmm. in context to what you have just said? Yes, uh, that's a valuable addition. Lord Buddha had said, so you think, so you are, which means what you think, you actually are. That can be a reality. So, which means that we should not limit our thinking that will help us self exceed so uh, the whole whole trust what we understood uh, is unconditioning and deep conditioning mm -hmm. yeah. uh, is the sadhana is just to access our psychic deep mm -hmm. is that right that's what uh, yes uh, um, you quite rightly said that uh, the essence of the whole thing is getting unconditioned uh -huh. because conditioning we can't help because of the environment in which we grow up, we can improve upon it by improving uh, our school education and our parenting. That is uh, not trying to tell the child uh, too often, at least, that, uh, oh no, don't be a dreamer, don't be unrealistic, this can't happen. So uh, instead of, uh, so we should not have, we should have less of conditioning, but then some conditioning is uh, inevitable as we grow up. So the process would consist of reversing this process and getting deconditioned. So at this stage, uh, our only way forward is meditation or uh, the self-reflection or anything more like that. So uh, this can accelerate or aid the process of mm. deconditioning at our stage. How we can get deconditioned a can be sort of a big thing in itself because that is what the process of sadhana is about but one thing negative that i can say is that in sri and the mother's yoga sadhana does not have a clear cut path which must be followed especially because you started with meditation which is a very common sort of a practice or common sort of a way to start that will we be able to decondition ourselves through meditation which means emphasis on just one technique no matter how powerful it is. That is not the path of Sri and the Mother's Yoga. Uh, meditation, yes, certainly can help. It is one of the acceptable techniques. It's one of the potential powerful techniques, but then it is still a technique. Sri Yoga is about bringing yoga into life, or if you may put it differently, that instead of uh, fixing uh, a particular period of the day for meditation, staying in a meditative poise all the time. So the entire process of sadhana is about getting deconditioned in a way. And how will that happen? That will happen, deconditioning will happen if repeatedly we discover that what we had come to believe in through the process of conditioning was our own limitation. It was the, not the limit of what is possible. It was not the limit of reality. It was not the limitation of truth. It was not the limitation of that total knowledge. 
So the more and more we realize that, uh, we get deconditioned and become more trusting of what is possible. Then we'll be able to believe that yes, it is possible for cancer to be cured or it's possible for a person to pray in New Delhi and uh, affect the health and well-being of a person in New York. Now all that will become possible when we get deconditioned. Thank you.